Um, thank you so much for asking me to come and talk. It was, to be honest, this was one of the talks that really phased me because I was obviously coming to a conference with people, maybe who hadn't done a lot of escape rooms, but were certainly interested in them. Um, and then I was asked to give a talk for an hour. And I thought that's going to be really hard because how do I, how can anyone talk for an hour and still be engaging? So um, I thought, right, OK, I'm going to try doing something a bit different. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you for an hour. Um, but there'll be some talking. And um, given that my talk is about risk taking and, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about failure, I thought I'd try something different. And given the technology, some of it might work, some of it might not work. But um, I thought that rather than talking about escape games, I would uh, check with, aha, make you escape the keynote. So and also, <laughs> So, a little bit about me. Obviously, I'm an evil professor. I love to hear the sound of my own voice, as as some academics do, apparently. Um, I'm a professor of education, at, uh, as Claire said, at Durham University, and my background is very much in terms of research in video games and research in learning technology and play in higher education. So I'm going to talk about some of my work and how it relates to escape games um, and some of the sort of play more generally. Now, Claire very kindly asked me to talk for an hour, but as I said, I'm a very, very important professor. Uh, so I thought I'm not going to talk for an hour. I love the sound of my own voice. So I thought I'd actually talk until the end of time. So when I finish this talk, I'm going to carry on and just keep going and keep going. Um, but I am going to give you a chance to escape, to not have to listen to me forever. Um, but what you're going to have to do during this talk is you're going to need to find three words that will enable you to escape the keynote during the next hour. Um, you, I'll, give, I'll give you some support to do that. I'll take you around some interesting places. Um, but I would ask that if you know the answers, you don't share the answers. Um, and once at the end, once you've got these three words, uh, you should be able to escape and we'll see how that goes. So um, I'm just looking at Claire. Is, is everything still because you froze for me a little bit? Like just one check. I didn't freeze. So that's all good. Brilliant. OK, so a little bit of background. I'm assuming that people here know a bit about escape rooms, but may or may not have played them. So I'll sort of give a, a view on what I think an escape room is. And I tend to use the, the word es escape game rather than escape rooms. So back in 2014, uh, one of my friends, um, I've got a sort of network of friends in higher education who are interested in play, sort of got in contact and said, this thing's opened in London. There's only one in the country. It's called Hint Hunt. And you, you essentially you get locked in a room physical room for an hour and you've got to solve puzzles to get out and I, I remember at the time thinking that sounds a bit weird but yeah we'll give it a go so four of us from different parts of the country arranged to meet up in London to play this thing um and I say at this time the, this was the only one in the UK it was this crazy important it was never going to catch on and we spent an hour it, it, it was it was a kind of detective's office type game um and none of us had ever been so engaged we, we got out with about 30 seconds to spare um, and there were really there were some physical puzzles and all different types of puzzles. And I remember I was going out and going for a pint afterwards and all of us going, that was amazing. And there was a second room at that time. So we tried to phone up and get on the second room and the waiting list was about six months. So it was a nice idea. But just the sitting there and going, there's something in this, there's something in this for education. Um, it's really, an, you know, the idea of being stuck in a room with with four people or however many people for an hour. I know it horrifies, it used to horrify my old boss in my previous institution who just said that's, I can't think of anything worse. But um, for us, it was a really exciting thing. Now it's evolved a lot since then, it's nearly 10 years later and escape rooms have become ubiquitous. You can't go anywhere pretty much and there isn't one. Um, but also it's evolved a bit. So there are things like sort of subscription escape boxes where you get a box through the mail that you then have to solve. Uh, there are treasure hunts, with the pandemic, there was a proliferation of online games and there's going to be some brilliant ones. I can't wait to play some later. So I think to, to me, the idea of it having to be a room that you escape out of, that, that's true in a lot of cases, but actually it's, esca it's escaping games because you as a group of people have to do escape through, through a thing. Um, so what makes escape games really interesting for education? To me, there are sort of three things. And one, and I know Claire's already kind of touched on, is the collaboration aspect, that actually you're having to work with people. And I've seen people do them who didn't know each other beforehand, but you have a very specific goal 
and you the, the trust builds up very quickly um and the idea of having to work together and good escape rooms are designed so that different types of puzzles appeal to different people i remember doing in the very first one that i did i have zero spatial awareness and these puzzle boxes i just can't get but my friend simon who was in the room he, he was just a genius with them he could pick them up and somehow see how they worked and open them uh, whereas kate he was amazing at codes and and i've got a friend who i do them with who's amazing at just seeing you know breaking stuff that shouldn't be broken and seeing things very laterally that can't be seen so it's the idea of getting different people with different skills um together i think it's really exciting i'm a huge fan of narrative and storytelling and i think there it's not something we necessarily use enough in to particularly in the uk and it was really interesting having come back from australia where storytelling is massive and accepted and part of how they teach um, and I think escape rooms is a way of getting that in simply because the power of storytelling is so great. Um, but also this idea of kind of puzzles and the flexibility of the format um, that within the narrative, the puzzles and how they're delivered and how they work together um, and how they're supported and people are supported through them. They, they're really creative and I think really support lateral thinking. So they're very flexible from a design perspective, but also from a player perspective, I think the kind of the lateral side is very, very important. So in terms of the problem solving, um, so I do a lot of cryptic crosswords and I'd like to think about this in, in a very similar way. So in a cryptic crossword, essentially you have a sentence which is called the surface. Um, and the surface is nothing to do with how you solve the, um, solve the, the crossword. So it's all about sort of, having a very plausible surface, but seeing beyond it. And the surface will aim to mislead. Um, but when you can discover and see the delight in actually working out what it is you have to do, that's where escape room puzzles, I think, are really exciting. Because if you look at problem solving, there's kind of two sides to it. One is working out what you need to do. And the second bit is doing it, the procedural bit. Um, and I think in traditional education, we often focus on the procedural bit without the contextual bit, the what you need to do, the interesting bit. Um, and escape rooms sort of turn that on their head because actually part most of escape room is working out. I've got all this stuff. What does that do? How does that relate to that? What does that mean? How can I solve that? And actually, once you know what you've got to do, the solving is generally fairly straightforward. So I wanted to give an example of this idea of a surface. So uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm going to take you to my favourite cafe. And let's see what they've got on for breakfast. So, oh, some delicious food. So in this cafe, there is a word. And um, I, I can, I've realised I can access the chat from, from another window. So what I'd like you to do um, is you've got, I'm going to give you five minutes on a timer um, to try and find the word in this. If you find it, please don't say share the solution. Um, I've, but could you put something in the chat to say you've solved it? It's also absolutely fine in the chat if you want to give other people hints. There's no problem with that. Um, I will drop a few hints later on if, I, if I'm finding that nobody solved it. So, uh, Claire, is that making sense to people or do people look bewildered? Good, excellent. OK, in which case I'm going to give you five minutes from now. Excellent. Well done. Those who are getting it very quickly. I could also say that the battered acarpi is my favourite absolute bargain. So again, if anybody who's got it wants to start dropping some clues in for people who haven't got it yet. Um, 
So it's a 50 50, isn't it? We've got a lot of yeses and we've got a lot of no. And that's the beauty of it. So some people, this particular problem is the one they click into, as we've discussed. Others, it just takes a little hint or two. So well done, those who've got it. So I think the, the COD still should be 16p, not 15p. OK, I can give you the clue that the P isn't pence. P refers to something else. So again, it's abs this, the surface is the menu, but it's absolutely nothing to do with the menu. Okay, so anyone still struggling? Again, the, the thing I find about puzzles is that you, you get different people looking at the same puzzles. Some, and it's nothing to do with kind of how good at puzzles you are or how clever you are or how much you know. Some people will just get certain ones and they'll be really obvious um, and some people won't. So I spent quite a lot of time testing these puzzles in advance with different people who I know who are puzzlers. And I and it was really interesting. I love watching people do puzzles. And I think this is the thing when you're designing them is that you think they're really easy. And I'll sort of talk a little bit about sort of the design process and how that works later. But you think they're really easy and then you just need to watch somebody else do them to realize actually uh no. So for anyone that's not got it quite yet, so you've got a couple of minutes left. So the, the P refers to place. So if you can think about 11th place or 13th place, what might that mean? What could that refer to? I'm really intrigued to the different word. I'm going to have to find out about that. OK. The question about accessibility, and I think this, this, is, a, um, this is something I'm going to touch on um, on later. And to me, I think it's about it goes back to this idea of there be people needing to work in a group that actually not everybody, if you did an escape room on your own, no matter how many you've done, I think you'd be really stuck, but actually having multiple people there to be able to discuss things um, it's, and, and people accepting that they're not gonna get everything. Oh, I'm intrigued to Daisy, can you explain how you got Jeannie? Sorry, it's just, it's the last letter in the last five lines. Oh, so it is so that's absolute. I would did not even notice that. Okay, so we've got another eighty, not not very long now. Okay, so we're going to stop. And the other thing is, don't worry if you don't get these things. Okay, that's your five minutes up. So, oh, am I what is making noises? So, can I ask somebody um, who did get it? Somebody, I'm going to see who got it first. Uh, yeah, I'm scrolling back to uh, explain. Oh, it's way back. Uh, so, I think it's Aideen. I apologize if I've um, got your name, um, pronounced your name wrong. Do you want to come on and uh, explain how you got it? Yeah, I could do that. Can you hear me okay? Um, my, my sound yep. is a little bit bad. <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of clicked. I suppose I was doing the escape room this morning, so maybe my brain was in that kind of a mode. And I just saw the numbers and thought, okay, what's the letter? That's probably the first way I would have tried to solve a puzzle like this anyway. Yeah, but probably just because we had done the escape rooms this morning, I think my brain was in that kind you of were in the thinking, escape lateral, mode. you know, lateral thinking. Whereas other times you would look at it and wouldn't really be able to. But yeah, I just looked at the numbers and then thought, what letter? Are there eleven letters in that? Yes, it could be eleven, thirteen, five, the fifth yeah. letter, the ninth, the eighth letter, that, the fourth letter. Absolutely, it. So it's essentially it's a one on. There's there's only one part to this puzzle. 
So it's it's working out how those numbers relate to those letters. So it's the 11th letter, second letter and so on. So that will give you the word rotate. So um, you might want to make a note of that for future reference. Um, and we will carry on. Um, let me just. Ah, I can see more people. Excellent. I've got I'm, I'm getting the hang of this now. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about play, because as I said, my research is my own research is in play and learning. My setup sorted now. Um, and for me, I think this is. Get the right, right page. Play, play in education is, is I think, I, I like to think of it as the as two things coming together that are really exciting. So, so play is partly about games. Um, and when I started doing research in this area, I was I came from a computer science background. My research was very much about video games. Um, and then I started working with people who were much more into analog games and other types of games and became kind of much more interested in in wider games. And what is it about games that is brilliant for learning? Well, that you know, they're active, they are constructivist learning environments about problem solving in an authentic context um, and they are have evolved to have engaging mechanics because games are essentially have evolved in something in our society that is there that people do voluntarily because they want to do um, they are designed to to keep us going and keep us playing I think those are quite important ideas for education linked with this is the idea of playfulness so it's playfulness I'm looking at as a kind of a way of um, being willing to suspend disbelief and open to new ideas and an intrinsic motivation to look at things differently and to play and, and to be sort of creative. And it's this juxtaposition of games and playfulness so that you get the two together that I'm talking about when I talk about play. So in the context of escape games, you have the two coming together really nicely. So you have the rules and constraints of the game, the time, the goals, but also you have people coming in with a playful attitude. So the openness to thinking differently, the openness to possibilities and the creativity and, and the imagination. Um, just to give you some examples of how powerful games can be. And I love this photo. This was taken by a colleague of mine, Claire Hampshire at Manchester Metropolitan University. And this is of students playing a game that we developed. Um, she, it was essentially her idea and I gave her some help with game mechanics called Staying the Course. And these are first year students. And these students in this photo have literally met each other five minutes before. And you can just see the laughter on, on their faces. Um, and what this did was this replaced an induction activity, which was used to be an hour long talk where people would go through, OK, here's the chaplaincy that you might need for this. And here's the financial services that you might need for this. And, and here's something else that you might need. Um, and it was reeling off a list of services that students weren't contextualised. It was very boring. And essentially what this game does is it introduces students to all the services through as you go through the board. Um, but it, it does it through playful scenarios. Um, so it provides context, it provides structure. The very fact that it's a, it's got pieces on it changes, it, it signifies play and it changes the dynamic. Um, so it can be really powerful for just changing how people think about things. Um, in terms of playfulness, I like to use this example because I think we, we when we talk about play, we get bogged down in games. So when people ask me what I do and I say play, they go, oh, games, gamification. And actually, to me, the idea of playfulness is, is possibly even more powerful um, because a very little thing can change how things how things get used and represented. So, for example, at one of my previous roles, we had a play book group. And I don't know how many people have joined a book group with all the best of intentions, um, but then life gets in the way. You're really busy. So I think at the first meeting, everyone had read the book. But the second meeting, some people were saying, well, I can't come because I haven't read the book. Uh, by meeting three or four, it, it was stopping people engaging. So we changed the rules of book club and we said, OK, the rules of book club are you've got to read the book or you've got to pretend you've read the book. And actually, we found that 
what mattered was not whether you'd read the book. What mattered was coming to conversation and talking about it. And I'm pretty sure on one occasion everybody was pretending because I subsequently read the book and thought, mm, not entirely sure that anyone was on the right page, but it didn't matter because that's what we were, what mattered was getting together. So it's that kind of playful twist. Um, of course, it's possible to have games that are not playful. So my favourite example of this is this is a game called Chore Wars. I don't even know if it's still available. But essentially, it's gamifying housework. And before we, long before we had children, myself and my husband, well, neither of us really liked having doing housework at all. Uh, now we've got children, they can just do it for us. Um, but essentially, we this this is a gamified system. So you put all your chores in, you allocate points, and then you can see who won. So I'm a huge gamer. He's not a huge gamer. So at the end of the, the first week, I'd set this up and, and I'd done all the chores and I got all the points. And I was really excited because I thought I'd won. And I just remember him looking at me going, you think you've you have? Really? Really have you? So um, so actually, it, it's kind of a reminder that a lot of gamified things aren't really a great deal of fun and they're not really terribly playful. Equally, it's possible to have playful things that aren't games. Um, for anyone, any runners um, may have seen th this kind of thing of, of doing running routes and things like Map My Run. Um, and this is my first, well, no, there's, there's a whole loads on the load of them on the internet. This is pretty much the only clean one that I could find. There's a lot of run based genitalia doing the rounds. Um, on the other side of it is things like um, Amazon reviews. And there are some really interesting ones. The, the, probably the most famous is the three wolves howling at the moon, where for some reason it just hit a zeitgeist. And there are hundreds of rev reviews about what a majestic T-shirt it is. Likewise, there's a 20 inch canvas print of Paul Ross, the little known and possibly even less talented brother of Jonathan Ross. Um, and uh, my favourite one of those is that somebody's written that if you only get one 20 inch canvas print of Paul Ross, make it this one. Um, but there's also a sort of serious side to this too. So at the top there, you can see the Miss Bick, which um, Bick thought it was a really good idea for, for probably about 10 years ago to have a pen for her, which was pink because our, you know, our little lady hands can't use black biros or anything like that. And essentially the internet just went mad on it. But rather than making an outrage about it, there were lots and lots of consumer reviews from men who were, were cross because they're these lady pens were breaking in their big masculine hands and women who were ex excited because they could now learn how to write and they could draw kittens but it was really effective and that's now been taken off the market and i think play can be much more effective in those kind of things than um than potentially other ways of doing things um so i now want to uh obviously i'm multi-talented academic and I'm also amazing at poetry so I wanted to uh, read you a little poem I'm going to give you five minutes uh, actually I'm not because I'm looking at the time I'm going to give you four minutes because I'm mean like that because uh, I want to do more of my talking uh, again there's a word in the poem and um, I've also given you there's a link there which is also quite interesting to different ways to write letters you may or may not need it but again I think one of the rules of escape rooms and escape games is that you give everybody the information they need to do it you don't expect them to know anything or to be able to go off do their own thing. So as a waitress in Sierra Leone, I once danced a tango alone. My white uniform, I believe, on that cold November Eve made my tango so bright that it shone. And what I'd like you to do, same rules as before, once you've got it, say you've got it in the chat. You also can give people clues, but don't give the answer. OK, so I'm interested whether you're thinking you have it. I think if you have it, you know you have it. And I think, again, that's another thing that's important for escape rooms is, is knowing that there's an answer and that you're sure you've got it. OK, so this one, this one does need a bit of additional information. You need to know, again, a lot of escape rooms rely on codes, which is great. I love codes. Um, and it is one of the codes that is available in the link that I've given you. And I like that link because there's so many different ones. It doesn't make it too obvious. Um, but again, this is one of the common codes that, that comes in. Brilliant. OK, so anyone that's got it, do you want to start dropping some clues in? Anyone that doesn't? Um, and again, this is one of these things that I think if, if you're you might see it straight away. OK, 
Okay. So if anyone that's not got it yet, you might want to think about um, NATO. I think don't, again, don't worry if you don't get it, because I say these are just some examples. And, um, you know, often in these situations, different people get different ones. It's, yeah, looking at what Jill says, this is, if, you, if you're a cryptic crossworder, this one's very straightforward. If you're not, um, it may be more difficult. I'm loving watching people um, work things out on the screen. <laughs> yeah, Emma, that's a really good point. I, I, I think it's weird that, I mean, certain mathematical ones I just cannot get even when I'm shown how to do them. And I think it's that everybody has different skills. And I think this is important when designing an escape room to think about how different people process so that there are different things that suit different people i would love to do a physical one but obviously doing a physical one online is quite difficult okay lots of people getting it now but 15 seconds left it's okay and we will stop there and i'm going to ask is it a nice clue um can i ask whoever came in first is it c11s is that chris um, could you would you mind coming in and explaining how this one works? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether at first I got it quite quickly, but I um, I held back a little till someone answered, so I uh, um, I so I wouldn't get picked on. Uh, oh, well, you've got picked on now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's the phonetic alphabet. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you again, this is one you've either kind of got to know it exists or not. That Sierra Tango Uniform November and Tango are all part of the NATO alphabet. Um, as I say, it's used a lot in cryptic crosswords. Um, and that would give you the word stunt. So you've, you've got, you should now have two words, then it will become clear what you do with them later on. Okay, right, so I'm going to move on. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I think this is my theory slide, so I apologise for people who don't like theory, but I think, again, when we're talking about play and playfulness, it's uh, it's really important to um, to to be to think about how we theorise this, because as a discipline, it, it kind of, it's often difficult to say, well, I, I work in play, and people say, well, do you, do, do you work with children? I say, no, play and adults, and, and they look at me like it's not really a thing. So actually, I think being able to to have that theoretical background is really important. And I like to use the idea of what's called magic circle. Now this um, was originally posited by a play anthropologist, Claude Huizinger, in the 1950s. It was then picked up by uh, game theorists, Salen and Zimmerman, and now myself and various other colleagues are writing about magic circle in relation to um, spaces in higher education. Now what's interesting about the magic circle is it's it is created, it's a mutually created thing when people agree to play a game. So whatever game that is. Um, and it's an agreement by people who are in the game space to abide by the rules of the game, even though the rules of the game are not the most efficient ways to do things. So, for example, if you agree to play chess, you are agreeing to abide by the rules of chess and the moves of chess. Um, obviously, you know, there, there is cheating and that makes us a little bit woolly. Um, but generally, if you want to win in chess and you want to get someone else's king, you could just go to the board, pick it up and run away. But that that breaks the rules of the game. That breaks the rules of the magic circle. Um, but it doesn't need to be just formal games. I mean, play ephemera is a great signifier of the magic circle. But you can watch small children playing house. Um, there are rules that they are mutually agreed and they might be fluid and they might be emergent over time. But they're still while they abide in the rules of the magic circle. Um, they are then then creating these spaces. And we see this all the time that people agree to play with one another um, in formal and informal contexts. Um, and what's really important for that, for me, there's three different things. So part of it is about it's this idea of a safe community. When you, what happens in the magic circle stays in the magic circle. Now, that's a very ideational 
idea in sort of the theoretical magic circle in real life there's obviously some overlap if you've done a team building game with your boss um you know in, in that may have there's obviously power dynamics there it's never perfect but the idea is that in the magic circle things can happen people can try things in different spaces um that it, it's about exploring possibilities about a willingness and an openness to try things that are new to take on different roles to think differently and to try things that because it doesn't have the impact or, or so much impact in the real world it allows people to think differently and try things differently um and thirdly because it involves voluntary engagement now there's a wonderful term that's coined by a play theorist called Bernard Suits, who wrote a book called The Grasshopper. And I say, if you read nothing else uh, on play theory, The Grasshopper is amazing because it's kind of set of Socratic dialogues between various interesting characters about what is play and what is games. And he had coined this term called illusory um, engagement and, and a illusory attitude. An illusory attitude is a willingness to give yourself in to the arbitrary rules of the game. So a kind of a spirit of play. And I think that's really interesting. Um, simply because if, if we could get students to give themselves into the spirit of play, to, to, to learn voluntarily, um, then, then it changes the dynamic of what education is about. And what's important for this idea, well, you've got the exploration possibilities, the safe community, the voluntary engagement, it presents a space for safe failure. And um, I'll talk a little bit about in, in a couple of slides about why I think failure is really, really important and why we're failing students, but why playful spaces and things like escape rooms and escape games can provide us that space. Um, but I did also just want to show you this photo. So this is a um, photo that was taken from play, the, the Playful Learning Conference last year. Uh, and this is people flocking. And for me, this is a bridge too far. This is why I'm taking the photo and I'm not part of the flocking. Um, but the in flocking, Matthias, who's at the front, um, had, and this was about day two of the conference, just said, let's do some flocking, follow me. And then he did the hands up and, and it was it's quite interesting. It's about 30 people just following him around, doing whatever he does, being really playful with it. Um, and it's just who just took that loose attitude and immersed themselves in the magic circle. So it's a really powerful thing. But it also highlights to me that we all play in different ways. I know there's we need to be really aware that play in whatever form can be exclusive. And again, this has already been kind of high. Somebody highlighted in the chat about well, how do we make sure that um, that it, that we can be inclusive in terms of when we're designing play and when we're designing playful experiences. Um, for me, escape rooms I think are quite good because they do explicitly facilitate different modes of play and different modes of participation, and they're also safe safe spaces to fail. Um, and actually, I think this is one of the big things that we're missing in higher education. Because failure in life is absolutely inevitable. We, everybody, you know, as human beings, we 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 are failing, um, and being able to manage it um, is really really important. Um, being able to kind of step out of comfort zones, to be innovative. If we can't fail, we're not prepared to take risks. We won't innovate, um, and we can't step out of our comfort zones. Um, and I think. We see students, um, you know, at, at coming into university who've never failed. You know, they've got they've passed, they've got straight A stars. And obviously, at some point, people fail in real life. People fail. And I, I think part of the issues that we have with kind of student well-being is a lack of ability to fail. And I think we actually fail our students by not supporting them to fail and not supporting them to see failure as a as a kind of process that gets us to, to achieving. And I think part of this is to do with the school system that we have. Obviously, we have these A in the UK, we have the one shot A levels that are the kind of accumulation of everything that people have done. And if you fail them, it's seen as a really bad thing. So is it any surprise that our students are, are afraid, afraid of failing? But if, for example, do you then look at something like video games and video games are a great way to teach failure? I mean, they're great for many other reasons, but I think actually games provide spaces for failing because games are designed to make people fail. If you didn't fail in a game, it would be a really boring game. And games, gamers are used to this process of practice, fail, try a new route, discuss, think, go back, reflect, fail. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad somebody got that uh, 
<laughs> that reference. Um, but failure is an intrinsic part of the game. Now, the reason I've put this slide up um, is this is for, uh, from Monkey Island. And Monkey Island, my favourite game, absolute game changer in terms of uh, uh, adventure games. So prior to kind of Monkey Island, a lot most of the adventure games that you would play are um, were to do with essentially text games, and you might be playing for however long. And if you failed or you got killed, or in my case, I I spent so much of my childhood playing The Hobbit and getting killed by the same pair of bulbous eyes about three quarters of the way into the game. I've never yet finished it. One of these days, I'm going to get an emulator and do it just uh, to complete it. Um, but you it didn't matter. You make one mistake and you'd be straight back to the beginning of the game. And it was, it was really frustrating. And what Monkey Island did was it kind of changed how these games were looking at failure. So there's only a couple of ways in the game that you can actually fail the game. This is one of them. And, and this actually involves going, taking an idol, going underwater and literally staying there until you die. You've, you've got to make a huge effort to do it. Uh, and lots of people would never find that way of dying. There's another way with a catapult. But for the majority of the game, um, you can't die. You can fail to progress or you can do things that have different consequences. But actually, and, and you can get stuck and it's really hard and it's really lateral thinking, um, but you can't have that kind of catastrophic fail. And the, the idea of these kind of micro fails versus catastrophic fails, I think, is something we need to think about in education, because how do we give students lots and lots of opportunities to micro fail without this this catastrophe of everything going horribly wrong? And again, for me, games and escape games just open so much potential. For, um, for these these kind of failures and thinking about how we give students opportunities to fail. And um, so I'm going to catch up on the chat, but before that, I'm going to take you to my favourite bar. And uh, while I'm off getting the drinks, um, I want you to look at these four dominoes that have been left on one of the tables. Again, this one's slightly more difficult. Um, again, there's a link to um, this the same document before, The Secret Ways to Write Letters, um, and there's a word hidden here. So I'm going to give you another five minutes, starting now, to find the word, same rules apply. Oop. I didn't realise you could fall off a cliff in uh, Monkey Island. I'm going to have to try and do that now. OK, is anybody getting anywhere with this? So there's two parts to it. It won't matter which resource you use. Uh, there is a code in there. Once you know the type of code, any resource that will tell you that code will, will be fine. I feel I should be playing the music from Vision On at this point. So if you have the letters and it doesn't make a word, then you're halfway there. Think about how you could put the letters in the correct order.
this is the point where I'm going, have I definitely not lost something in translation here? I think you've got it. Excellent. OK, brilliant. OK. So, so, so you, you're using a code that would be more, you're using it visually, but it's more often tactile. So one half of the dominoes will give you the code. The other half will tell you the order to put the letters in. Have I messed it up? It's quite possible. It's part of the problem is when you spend so long testing and rewriting, things do get lost. <laughs> so I or I've made a mistake on purpose to show you how failure works. We could we could play it like that. Okay, we've got another. Right, I'm going to stop there. So, Brianna, are you happy to talk through your process? We'll see if I've got it wrong or not. Good morning um, from the United States. I am I am still waking up, so pardon me for not turning on my camera yet. No problem. Um, I I think having done something similar, but I love this approach. Um, I knew it was Braille, at least that's what I anticipated, um, but I hadn't used it with dominoes, so I love that. So I looked that up and found letters um, mixed up, V-O-T-E. Um, they were, I figured though that I didn't even look at the top until you had mentioned that with the numbers. So I just, because it was a short word, I figured it out. And in fact, the code I had used with Braille before was C-O-V-E. So it wasn't too far ah. <laughs> to go from Cove to vote. Anyway, so that's what I went with. But I appreciate the other person because sometimes there's ways to do it without using this extra clue. And sometimes you can unscramble things yourself in your head. Um, yeah, so, I, I think uh, with, with this one, because there were different, it could also be in veto. And I, I, I may uh, well possibly have got the numbers. Sure the wrong way around oh, sure. and I apologize if that's the case it's meant to be vote um but yes so what I wanted to do with this one is kind of show there's two parts to it so part is getting mm -hmm. the letter and then part is knowing the order to put them in and this again escape rooms use that kind of puzzle quite a lot but again to me I, the part of it as well is that, that whole idea of the surface these look mm -hmm. like dominoes but have nothing to do with dominoes and I think for, when I go to escape rooms and it's that aha moment of absolute joy when you realize that all the assumptions you made are wrong that it is just so thanks thanks sure, Emma. thank you and i and i'm sorry I, i'm still waking up so i may have gotten the whole numbers thing confused maybe in an yeah. hour i'll get <laughs> no no it, it, i think it's, it's entirely my though. my error that some point when i've been doing different dominoes they've got transposed and it just shows yes. that no amount of checking and double checking will actually um that is my experience as well, but I just love your playfulness in that when it, <laughs> it's mixed up, you make it quickly changed and I do it all the time. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think this is just just part of it. So I will move on because whoa, we're almost out of time and it seems to be going very quickly. Right. So um, so so the essentially that's the two parts there. So now you will have three three words, stunt, rotate and vote. And in a minute, we're going to have to uh, think about what we do with them. So I just wanted to tell you a little briefly about an, an escape room project that we did and how that kind of going back to failure pre presented a model for failure. Um, so 
back in 2016, uh, we ran a three year project called Edgescapes, and this was working with one of our uh, one of the local secondary schools in Greater Manchester. Um, and what we were doing is the idea was getting students not to play escape rooms, but to design escape rooms again, because like with playing games, designing games is this iterative process that you never get it right first time. And you know what, even if you test it a lot, you often never get it right at the end. But um, it was about getting these these are high flying students um, getting them to learn how to fail. Um, so we ran for, ran it for three years. The first two years, we had 12 students in the third year we expanded it and had 40 students and then they produced games that we showcased at the playful learning conference so we, we kind of expected that it that students would really get into the team working the problem solving what really surprised us was the idea of that they actually increased confidence in what they were doing and particularly when they were testing their games they were testing them on their teachers and that came up again and again that they'd created something that their teachers couldn't do but when they showed them how to do it they were really surprised so we had a sort of three phases in what we did so we had a we started off with taking them to play in their teams to, to go and play in escape rooms we used it as team building and also learning about what escape rooms were then we had this iterative design cycle of building testing. We had at least three iterations where they tested their games with their friends, the teachers and their parents. And then they had to do sort of the live presentation at the conference. Um, so from this, we kind of looked at, well, what does that look in terms of a model for failure based learning? Um, which comes down to these three areas. So the preparation, the, the taking the time to team build and to prepare is really important. And then this iterative cycle of playing, failing, reflecting, revising, but explicitly doing something that you will fail at many times. Um, and the idea of presentation is there is no assessment. And I could I could do a whole separate talk, which is me basically ranting about assessment for, for an hour for an hour. But it's about by presentation, it's doing something that's real world. So actually, it's about trying the same thing again and again and then being able to do do something that, that is tried and tested in the real world. Um, that it's non-linear and, and again we think of, of learning as being linear and, and here's the thing and it's all step-based and it's concepts and but actually it's not it's about doing the same thing and practice it sets students expectations of failure and about improvement and it's really about sort of rethinking assessment and what we do and I'm running out of time so I'm going to give you the way to find um, the last part of the puzzle so and to escape the keynote now, um, we've got slightly less time than I was expecting. So what I need to do is I want you to work together. You can discuss this. You can. Um, I need one of you to uh, to tell me that you have escaped the keynote. Um, and do and you'll know what you need to do when you've escaped. I'm not going to time this, but I will stop you. Well, to be honest, if we get to the hour, I'm just going to start the keynote at the beginning again. Well, not sure about anyone else, but I could keep listening quite easily. <laughs> Been wonderful. So again, this is all of you against me at this point. And I can give clues if necessary. So you need. So yes, you're trying to find a nine letter word for the site. And you've got three words already. You need to know which order to put them in. And you need to know you need to know what the three lines in the, in the square mean. And I was kind of hoping if anybody does know what they mean, then they can share that. Those are from what, what three words, which is like from a what sort three of words. Yep. map thing. So, so it's you, then, in... you need to work out what th you've got the three words, but you need to work out which order they go in. Oh. And you've got 
a ladybird, a lamb and a starfish to help you do that. Oh, so we've got, OK. And there's a clue right at the top. It's the number of legs. It's to do with the number of legs, yep. So what order would you put them in? Exactly, Lorna. Ladybug. So how does that relate to the words? Don't have a clue. Yep. So when you put them into what three words, what do you get? Yeah, so the number of letters relates to the number of legs. So you'll know what to do. So, yep. So it's a little village in Cumbria, which is spelt Torpenhow, but pronounced Trepenna, where I went on holiday about three weeks ago. Yeah, no, it's fine at this stage. It's absolutely fine. I think we, we need to sort of, oh, yep. So it's it's lovely, Billy. If you're in Cumbria, there's nothing there, but it, apart from one of my friends who's very lovely. Um, you'll know what to do. I've not seen anyone get there yet. Because you, when you have... Trepenna, you need to do something with it. Yay, we have a winner. Well done, Matt website of funeral service it's okay so we're getting people raising their hand now i did have a cunning plan about I've, i have also um when you get to the website if you go to tinyurl.com slash trepenna uh you get to a uh, a website which tells you to raise your hand and also gives you a background to download but i couldn't change my own background so i'm not sure who will be able to now so the number of legs relates to the order. The number of legs relates to the number of letters um, in the words. So rotate has six letters, vote has four letters. So this one is complicated. There's lots of bits to it. You've got to know it's what three words. You've got to relate the legs to the words in order. You've then got to be able to get to work out Trepenna and go to the tiny URL. Well done, everybody. You have escaped the keynote. And uh, that is the end of my talk. And thank you for listening. And you'll be pleased to know you don't have to listen to it for infinity now. Um, but I think we've got sort of five minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to be around for lots of today as well. Um, but just to say thank you.